Good morning, brothers and sisters. Okay, uh, you may you may notice that uh, you can look look around, and we we might have uh, less uh, brothers and sisters because some of them will ha have available in March and April every year to go back to China, visit their family, and and some people are just on vacation. Uh, so. And our our uh, press team will also uh, have a kind of a hard time because see we, we don't have our, our keyboard and uh, so we we kind of lack of members. So I want to invite you if you have some talents and if you are, you are willing to serve serve in worship, uh, you could come and join us. And uh, and if possible, and we I hope with very limited member right here, uh, we could still. Uh, Praise loud, so uh, so in Lord's place, in His place, we uh, we pray, and uh, our praise can reach Him. And actually, there's two astral microphone uh, in front of the, the the desk, so you you guys can grab grab one if you are willing to sing it out. And uh, mainly uh, today, uh, our our brother friends. Is willing to join join us, and uh, actually in the morning, I just I just know he is willing to uh, join our praise team, and uh, um, thanks God, we we got an actual member, and uh, we we can uh, win through the hard time. So uh, I want to praise our Lord. The plan is about all. It's about our Im imaginations. So may everyone stand up, and we start our practice.
Scripture this morning as we we are in probably the most somber message, the most somber subject found in the Word of God. Uh, the day our Savior was crucified, we're going to be speaking this morning of Calvary. Um, this is not a time for levity. This is um, serious information. And I, I just pray that if you don't know the Lord, that today you consider that there was one who was willing to die in your place. One who loved you even unto death so that you could have everlasting life. And I need to stress the importance of this because he is the only way. And if you question that, if you challenge that, well, then I would challenge you to take a look at some of the other suggested possibilities. And you'll find out very quickly that they have huge holes in their theories about life and particularly about the life that is to come. And, and I hope that all of us understand this morning, this world and this life that we are experiencing is not all there is. What a, what a horrible, if I can use the word joke, to play on intelligent beings uh, than to say that all there is is these few short fleeting years that we experience in our, in our lives as we uh, traverse, uh, as we find ourselves dwelling here on the planet Earth. Let's look to God in prayer, and as we do so, are there any special requests, any, any things that need to be brought up this morning as we look to the Lord? You know, if we, if we covered all the stuff that you see and hear on the news, we would be doing requests 
for the first 15 minutes of our service. And it's, uh, it's a very troubled world that we live in, the wars and the shootings and the disease and things taking place in the world around us. And we, in Sunday school this morning, we read these words, all that is in the world, and it spoke of other things, but uh, with just that comment, all that is in the world, and the world is passing away. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the ear of the Almighty. We thank you for an audience with heaven. We thank you that in coming together today, we are able to do so with expectation and hope, knowing that you hear our cry, knowing that you undertake for our need and you are the one that has promised to supply all our need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And today as we survey the wondrous cross, as we read these scriptures having to do with Jesus' death upon that mountain called Calvary, for him to be lifted up, that he might draw all mankind unto him. We thank you for so great a salvation. We sing often, hallelujah, what a savior. And we thank you as we look into the word of God and as we look around us at other philosophies and understandings of life, they are devoid of salvation. They don't offer a savior. Some, some of these religions very clearly state that their God, their God concept offers no salvation, no way of approaching, no way of a relationship with him. And we're thankful, our God, that we have a Savior who came down into this world, who dwelt amongst men. Your word says we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And this morning, he is the one who we would say glory be to God. And we thank you this morning for the coming king who died and rose again. And we thank you, our Father, for the hope of everlasting life that is found in him. Bless us in our time together this morning. Bless special requests. I know that there are answers to prayer. I, I, I have to mention that my sister Judy is progressing well, and yet there's an additional prayer for her as far as her physical needs and recovery from this accident that she had. And for the world around us and for the governments of not only our land, but the nations throughout the world. We know that there is a need that the gospel might go forth and we pray our Father for liberty and justice uh, throughout the world, even where it's not professed. And we pray our God that you would uh, speak to those that rule in high places and might they understand that you are the one and only true potentate. You are the sovereign God. And we bow before you this morning with expectation, with thankfulness, and with worship and praise. In the name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We find ourselves this morning in Mark chapter 15. And I hope you have a copy in front of you and you can follow along. I have to tell you that in choosing the scriptures for today... Uh, looking at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was hard to know exactly where to start and the particular portions to choose. Uh, I, you don't find anything from Matthew on your sheet that you have in your hand this morning because Mark's, uh, Mark's covering, uh, Mark's reporting of the cross was very much, I'm going to use the word borrowed from Matthew, 
and uh, there's no, there's nothing to hide there about that. Uh, and, and yet Mark is a little more concise, uh, a little easier to use. And so, especially since we're studying the Gospel of Mark, uh, you have Mark chapter 15 at the upper left-hand corner of your page. Uh, there was a couple of verses, and interestingly, uh, both Matthew and Mark, they are the only of the Gospels that mention that there was a drink that was offered to Jesus uh, as he was approaching the cross, and it was that of uh, wine mingled with gall. And there's a lot of discussion about what that implied, uh, that it was something that was used as a pain killer uh, and so forth. I, I have to be honest with you, I don't know the science of it, and I'm not sure how important it is, except for the fact that Jesus refused it. And the other thing that we have seen on different occasions in the regard of the Lord Jesus Christ, for example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where what he was experiencing was such that the average person would lose consciousness, uh, Jesus remains totally uh, in touch with everything that's going on. And rather than backing away or uh, removing himself from the pain and anguish, uh, he's willing to move forward and does so in the regard of those that approach him and in the regard of the, uh, the horrible uh, treatment that he received and the pain and the anguish that takes him to and that he experienced at the cross of Calvary. But uh, let's begin at verse 24, Mark chapter 15 and verse 24. And crucifying him, they divided his garments and they cast lots for them. If you're not familiar with casting lots, uh, we might uh, use something a little more common to our day, uh, tossing dice. Uh, the word lots is the root word of lottery. I guess we understand that in the regard of that type of uh, activity, there is chance involved, and uh, there are those that uh, have, they, they have an involvement in a choice that's totally given to chance. And uh, that's, maybe that's a bit of an oxymoron in itself, but here they are uh, looking at the final, the last possessions that Jesus had to his name, and they are, they're not just dividing them up uh, or even bartering for them, uh, they're, they're gambling for them. Um, imagine this taking place in the moments before Jesus is hung upon the cross. And let me just say, as cruel as we know crucifixion to be, and as we read about this horrible behavior, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for us to acknowledge that human beings can stoop this low. And I, I would say to you this morning that where we stand at the foot of the cross, uh, as the song says, beneath the cross of Jesus, we are seeing man at his absolute worst, but we are seeing a gracious and loving God at his absolute best. I, I like the words of, of the hymn, where, and this is beneath the cross of Jesus, where it says, O trysting place, where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. Uh, uh, Jesus himself has made the statement uh, that he could presently call uh, legions of angels to deliver him from the consequences of these human behaviors and decisions that were being made. Uh, a man from Battle Creek uh, wrote a song. Uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. And yet, uh, 10,000 is far below the limit that the scripture even suggests. And yet, Jesus willingly and lovingly moves forward to the cross, knowing what would befall him, and understanding the purpose of God that he might endure such suffering 
for us. I do want to say to you, as we're looking at this horrible behavior, uh, it was not the evil uh, notions and behavior of mankind that atoned for our sin. Uh, that's what got Jesus to the cross. And in fact, we're going to read about his being fastened uh, with, with nails uh, to, a Roman, to a Roman cross. And it's not, it's not a torture stake. Uh, not, it, it would have been a, a stake with a cross beam uh, that lends itself to why breaking the legs of those that were on the cross would accelerate their death. Uh, if, they were just, if they were just hung on a torture stake, like the Jehovah's Witnesses would like us to believe with their hands above their head, uh, what do we tell people to do when we want to assist them in their grieving? We tell them to put their hands above their head. And uh, so breaking the legs of these that were crucified with Jesus would not have sped up the process of their death at all unless if they were hung on a cross. It was important, and you'll see in the cross that we have here at the front, that there was a place where as their feet were fastened, they also had the ability to push themselves up and that allowed for them to breathe. Otherwise, uh, their chest would very quickly fill with the fluids from being able to inhale but not exhale. And so breathing itself was a, a real struggle for those that were enduring death by crucifixion. So uh, keep in mind, though, that even while on the cross and as he was hung there to die, those first three hours where he hangs and is subject to the ridicule of mankind, to the unkind things that they said, to the taunting and the uh, abuses, the verbal abuse that they hurled at Jesus. Uh, those things did not pay for our sins. Uh, mankind was not the one who exacted judgment upon Jesus other than Roman crucifixion. But when we come to the point in our reading this morning, and we'll see this a couple of times, and in fact in each of the Gospels, where from the noon hour, from the, the time of the sun being in the, in the midst of the sky, until the third hour, which we would say from noon until three, from in their time from the sixth until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land, and that's where God fulfills through his own son giving his life. This is where the Lord God has laid on him, the Lord Jesus, the iniquity of us all. During those three hours of darkness, Jesus faced eternal punishment. He, um, I, I used a little line from a, a hymn, I believe it was last week, on him almighty vengeance fell enough to sink a world to hell. And during that time, the Lord Jesus Christ endured in himself what you and I would have experienced in an eternity, lost and apart from God and his wondrous grace and love. So they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them who may take what? And it was the third hour and they crucified him. This would be nine o'clock in the morning. And the inscription of his charge was written above him, the king of the Jews. I mentioned before, and it bears repeating, that this third hour that we have mentioned here is the time when we're looking at Roman time, or yeah, Roman time rather than Jewish time, and that's why it's different than how we would perceive time. And the inscription of his charge was written above him, the king of the Jews, or this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two thieves, the one on his right and one on the left of him. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Interestingly, the Lord Jesus Christ is, he's on the list of those that are uh, looked upon as being the worst. Uh, he was seen 
as he hung there on the cross as a malefactor, one of whom wrong had been proven. And yet we know from the word of God that he is the holy, sinless, spotless lamb of God, who, as we read in Peter, became sin for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Calvary is the place where justice was met out upon an innocent victim that the guilty, the sinner, might go free. And you and I can identify, I hope we do, identify with that this morning and acknowledge from our own hearts, it was for us he hung and suffered there. He was numbered with the transgressors and those passing by blasphemed him, shaking their heads and saying, aha, uh, the one who was able to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down, descend from the cross. Now, if Christ were to do that, if he were to allow that his decision uh, in self-preservation uh, that he would come down from the cross, he would, have, he would have caused that this entire world would be condemned to eternal judgment. And yet, this is the mockery that they throw at him. These are the things that they said as they stood below the foot of the cross. And likewise also the chief priest mocking to the scribes said with one another, he saved others, but he's not able to save himself. Uh, the Christ, the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross. And when we see that, we will believe. Well, if they were to see Jesus descend from the cross, there would be no hope. There would be no salvation for lost and guilty sinners. And on either side of them, there's thieves. Uh, we spoke about them a little bit last week. Uh, in fact, we, we talked about a man named Barabbas that was involved in a, an insurrection against the government, something that we hear a lot on the news today. Uh, and in that insurrection had committed murder and is also called a thief. But here, the other two that are hanging on the cross, uh, they also mocked him and um, they, they insulted him. And in the sixth hour, which would be noon, darkness occurred over all the land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama, sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I do want to notice as we look further in the scripture and we'll be seeing this, uh, across the page in Luke chapter 23, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he looks down and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, we also see in verse 46 of Luke chapter 23, as Jesus yields up his spirit, he says, Father, into thy hands, or I commit my spirit into your hands. And remarkably, this utterance of Jesus in the regard of those to whom he speaks forgiveness, as well as the commitment of himself unto a holy father in heaven, he uses that intimate term, crying out to God as his father. But notice what we have here in verse 20, uh, in, in verse, I'm sorry, verse 34. My God, my God, why have you turned, why have you forsaken me? This is a quotation that comes from Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. These are the words that Jesus takes upon his own lips. It was very common, and even today, it's common amongst the Jewish nation, and even in the church, we as Christians many times will take upon our own lips the words of Scripture 
particularly the Psalms. You hear me quoting Psalms. You hear me quoting uh, verses of hymns. Uh, it's a very common way to express oneself. And Jesus, it says, began to say, my God, my God. I believe that at this point, he begins to quote Psalm 22. Why have you forsaken me? Here is the very Son of God, unable at this point to even refer to God in heaven as his Father and cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I like verse 3. It's important in Psalm 22 to read the third verse. It says, because you are holy. And Jesus' rejection there as he's hanging upon the cross is because he's hanging under the eye of, and I say that um, realizing that the face of God was turned against him, but there he is, God who cannot look upon sin turns away from his suffering son at the place of Calvary. I hope that today that touches your heart. I hope that you understand that whereas we look for acceptance and especially in the regard of our own parents and such, we expect that uh, even when we fail and when there are things in our own behaviors that cause our parents disappointment and maybe even a situation where we find ourselves under uh, judgment and correction from our parents, we know how much that hurts. And yet here's the holy, sinless, spotless Son of God hanging upon a cross, bearing our sin. He was made sin for us. He, the just one, died for us, the unjust, that he might bring us to God. What a dark moment and dark in reality as for those three hours Jesus hangs alone and forsaken at the cross. Let's read further. Some standing by who heard, verse 35, said, Behold, he calls for Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. Uh, the others said, Leave him alone. See if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus, with a loud cry, died. Um, Mark doesn't mince words. He just says it as it is. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And I want to just mention something quickly about vinegar. Uh, if you've ever, have, have any of you ever taken a swig of vinegar? Um, I, I know, yeah. <laughs> how, how strong was your voice after you uh, chortled that down? <laughs> I know that there's a lot of recommendations and everybody's giving me ideas on heart health and, and such, and they say uh, two tablespoons of vinegar and a glass of water with a tablespoon of honey. And I got, I got to be honest with you, even when you have thinned it up with that much water, uh, vinegar is not an easy thing to drink. But imagine vinegar being offered to someone who has hung in the heat of the day for six hours now, three hours leading up until noon time, and from noon until three, hanging there, and here's Jesus, and we read uh, in, in, I guess it's John, uh, yes, I'm sorry, verse 28 of John chapter 19, Jesus says, I thirst, and you can only imagine how thirsty he might be, how thirsty after six hours of hanging in horrible pain and anguish in the warmest, the hottest part of the day until, of course, the sun refused to shine. Jesus says, I thirst. And what did they give him to drink? Uh, they give him vinegar. And yet, I, this, is, this is a small miracle, but after receiving the vinegar, Jesus, with a loud voice, cries out, and we know from John chapter 19 that he cried out, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. He, he breathed his last. Well, that's how Mark covers it. And it's, as I said, very concise. 
uh, yet it has the details of not only that were shared by the Gospel of Matthew, but also we'll see some of that as we read further. But Mark uh, gives us in his report these things concerning the cross of Christ. And everything is there that you and I need to understand the seriousness of this moment and also the sorrow that was undertaken by the person of our Lord Jesus Christ as he hangs there at the hands of a holy God suffering for our sin. I have to ask you this morning, when you consider even times when you have within yourself experienced guilt, when you have felt sorry for behaviors that you have done and things that wrongfully took place in your life and you grieved over mistakes, even intentional sins, uh, are you aware of what it must have been for someone, an innocent victim, to take not only, the Bible says, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He became sin for us, one who knew no sin. I hope that today it touches your heart. I hope that today as we voice the words of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, he was crushed because of our iniquity, the chastisement, the punishment for our peace with God was laid upon him, was poured out upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I remember in my own personal situation the first time that I ever saw the cross. And I was sitting alone in the minutes before a, a gospel revival meeting in a little tent, and the words of Isaiah 53 came to my heart and for the first time in my life I was able if you will to put my name in that verse he was wounded for my transgressions he was bruised for my iniquities the chastisement the punishment that I deserved was laid upon him and by the wounding by his stripes I am healed. And it's used sometimes as a verse about uh, divine healing. Uh, let me just say to you this morning that the worst of all diseases, the worst of any affliction that could ever come upon a human being is the disease of sin. And wonderfully, the cross is the remedy for that most afflicting of all diseases. I pray that today you'll understand as you come before the cross, as you stand beneath the cross of Jesus, that you will, as the hymn writer said, uh, upon that cross you'll see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 23, just down the page. Luke chapter 23, the 26th verse. And as they took him, they apprehended a certain Cyrenian coming from a field, and they laid the cross upon him to carry it behind Jesus. And I checked every text that I could check, and that's what it says, that Simon from Cyrene, uh, who was... Um, well, he, he, I, I, he, somewhat forced by these soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus. I, I doubt that there was reluctance, but nevertheless, it says that he carried, he assisted Jesus in carrying the cross behind him. Now, if, if I got this right, and you imagine Jesus with the cross upon his shoulder, uh, carrying it at the cross beam and dragging it down the road as he's on his way to Calvary, imagine then someone in the appearance of assisting, picking up the, the tail of the cross, and as they follow Jesus, carrying the cross behind him, it 
probably would have put more weight upon the Lord Jesus himself. Thanks for the help. But uh, just imagine in your own mind what it had to have been. I don't, I don't like the stations of the cross where they talk about Jesus stumbling and falling and so forth. Um, and yet I see that in weakness and defeat, he won the, the meat and crown. He trod all his foes beneath his feet by being trodden down. And they come to the place called Calvary, but on the way there, an enormous crowd of people and of women who also wailed and lamented over him, followed him, and turning, Jesus said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but for yourselves and because of your children. Because behold, the days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the childless and the wombs which never delivered and the breasts which never nursed. In that day, they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. This is a quotation out of Hosea chapter 10, verse eight. But interestingly, you'll find this later written by, the, by John the Apostle in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, of a coming day, a day when the judgment of God will fall upon this earth, and in that day, the fear of the righteous hand of God in judgment against lost sinners who have gone too long in the rejection of the Savior will find themselves facing the fierceness of God's wrath and they cry for the mountains to fall and cover them and for the hills to come and cover them from the face and from the mighty wrath of God. I would use this this morning because we need to understand that this time of opportunity to receive Jesus is in this life only and the time of opportunity to get saved, as we would say, to receive him as your personal savior. There is a day coming, the word of God is very clear, when the door will be shut. And the opportunity to avail oneself of so great salvation will be over. And the Bible tells us of a coming judgment and tribulation that will fall upon this earth. And in that day, They'll be calling upon the mountains and the hills to fall upon them, to cover them from the face of Almighty God. Can I say to you this morning that there is a need for us to realize as we perceive the brevity of time that the day is coming when the opportunity for salvation will be over and in that day, men's hearts will cry out in fear and they will call upon everything and anything that they can imagine to cover them from the judgment of God that will fall upon a lost and condemned world in that day when the cry will be too late. So this morning, we would encourage you, if you've never come to Jesus, we would encourage you, if there has never been a time when you've responded to this offer of mercy, when you've recognized that a loving God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all of this that we're reading about this morning has been accomplished on your behalf because of one who loved you enough that he would give his life for you. I, I have to look at my own situation and I acknowledge there's not a lot of people in this world that I would die for. I've got a son, I've got a daughter, I've got a granddaughter, and first and foremost, I've got a wife at home. And I have to tell you that when it comes to a threat, um, and, and I, I can tell you some stories, uh, and I, we won't get into that, but I'll tell you that I'm there in their defense and willing to lay my life on the line for them. But what does God's word tell us about the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross? It tells us that while we were yet sinners, when we were far from God, when our condition was that of lost and hopeless and helpless, 
It was at that time when we were yet without strength in due time, or at, we would say in the nick of time, or at the appropriate, at the best of times, Christ died for the ungodly. And so this morning, let us, as we stand below the cross, as we look up to the face of one who could not even look up to his own Father in heaven and had to recognize rejection because of guilt, might we recognize that the guilt was ours. He himself was sinless. In bearing our sin, he never himself ever became essentially guilty, but he bore our guilt and suffered there upon the cross. I, I'm just going to mention to you verse 31 of Luke 23, because if they do this in a green tree, and Jesus is speaking of himself as the tree of life, what will be done, what will happen in the dry tree? In the day that's being spoken of, when they would call upon the mountains and the hills to cover them, is the day that there will be a false Christ. A day coming to this world when the Antichrist will lift himself up, professing to a, a world of, of lost individuals for whom there is no hope. He will profess himself as the Savior. He will profess himself even standing in the temple of God, that he is God. And Jesus says, you know, if they would do this to the tree of life, what's going to happen in that coming day when the greatest deception that has ever been launched upon mankind is given over and professes to be the hope of a lost world. And so uh, this is your time of opportunity. Jesus is the tree of life. The cross is even though we sing the words, old rugged cross, the, the cross of Calvary is a tree of life to those who recognize what was accomplished there on our behalf. Verse 32 of Luke 23, then also two others, convicts were led away with him to be executed. And when arriving at the place called the skull, and it's kind of fascinating to read this, in Greek, because the word is actually cranium, at the place called the skull, they crucified him there with the convicts, one from the right and the other from the left of him. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And then more about the dividing of his clothes, about the inscription that hung over the cross. And then verse 39, Luke 23, 39. One of the hanged convicts, blasphemed him, saying, if you're the Christ, do something. Save yourself and save us. And the other in response rebuked him, saying, don't you fear God, seeing that we are of the same condemnation of the same sentence? And for us, rightly, because we are receiving justice for our behavior, for our actions. But this man did nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, so be it, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over all the land until the ninth hour, and the sun darkened, and the veil of the temple, that which separated sinful man from the holiness of God. That huge dividing curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. And with a loud voice, Jesus cried, Father, I commit my spirit into your hands. And saying this, he breathed his last. He released his spirit. Um, there's one other thing that I would like to mention uh, in the regard of the... Uh, events here at the cross, and this is going to have more to do with our subject next week as we talk about Jesus' burial, uh, his being taken down from the cross. The, the words and the incidents and conversations that took place regarding the soldiers, and where this malefactor, this convicted criminal, 
receive salvation just as Jesus is about to breathe his last, he, he may rightfully be the last, if you will, Old Testament convert and comes to Jesus Christ as Jesus' life is coming to its very end. But I was reading about the, the soldier that stood beneath the cross and he looks up at Jesus and as he, as he sees the, uh, or hears the exclamation and sees Jesus' behavior as he leaves this life and yields up his spirit, he says, truly, this man was an innocent man. And then he says, truly, this man was the son of God. Um, Perhaps, and, and I would say, maybe undoubtedly, the first believer after the cross. The first believer, the first one to avail himself of this wonderful salvation and recognize Jesus for who he is, stands there at the foot of the cross. One of the soldiers, perhaps, who drove nails through his hands and feet, just doing his job, lifting up the cross, watching, observing what takes place for the purpose of Roman record and being responsible for uh, what we would call, I guess, uh, making sure that when Jesus died, when he expired, that he was truly dead. They were there to make sure, uh, maybe perhaps the soldier who pierced his side. But nevertheless, comes to Jesus Christ in full faith, recognizing him for who he is and acknowledging this man is the son of God. Our prayer today, as we look at these, these horrible moments, these six hours, but three hours where the Lord Jesus Christ endured the wrath of God against his holy soul, our desire this morning is that our exclamation, our observation would cause our own hearts in full faith to believe that this one who died for sin upon the cross was there, he died and suffered for us. And that today we would acknowledge Jesus died for me. We would acknowledge truly this man is the son of God. And I pray that as we uh, move towards and, and by the way, uh, Good Friday is just, it's, it's just a few days away. And then Easter, thank God that after that uh, observance of Jesus' death on the cross and after what we're reading here, it's wonderful to know that the resurrection, it's wonderful to know that Easter is just around the corner because you and I celebrate not only a crucified slain sacrifice for our sins, but we celebrate one who having accomplished all that was required of him and all of the judgment of divine justice against our souls, Christ not only died for our sins according to the scriptures, but he rose again according to the scriptures and the testimony and the witness of those that have seen him after his resurrection declared that the Lord is risen indeed. And I hope that as we've read the word of God today and the sorrow and the sadness connected with the cross, our hope is that you'll also involve yourselves and rejoice in the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge the Lord is risen and that your hope is in one who today is seated at the right hand of God and in a coming day will return in glory for all who believe on him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Son of God who loved us and who gave himself for us. We thank you, our God, that as dark as Calvary was, 
It brings light to our hearts. If there was ever the perfect example of all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, it would be these final actions of Jesus as he gives himself an atoning sacrifice for our sins and suffers and bleeds and dies and bears the judgment of divine wrath against himself on our behalf. And we praise and glorify our blessed Savior this morning. We would say from our hearts, Jesus died for me. And this morning we would live in the light of his resurrection life and say that because he lives, we live also. So bless us today as we go from this place. We would pray especially if there's anyone here who is halting, if there is anyone here that would hesitate and instead of uh, walking from this place uh, with the salvation of God blessing their soul, we would ask you that today uh, they would be open and that they, were, they would receive in their own hearts this wonderful salvation and this loving Savior. We give you thanks in his worthy and precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a response hymn, and it's uh, hundreds of years old. This, this is a, a beautiful hymn, and we're going to sing the first and the second verses. Please stand. Thank you. 